as the first assistant, many times you're the one who is assisting with the induction because the circulator and the scrub tech are busy doing their thing. So there's a lot of things that you can do to assist with the induction. And I'm going to assume that you're standing on the right side of the patient because that's where all of these things can be done from. Some of them can do, be done from both sides, but most of the time you're going to be on the right side of the patient if you're doing this. So if the patient has a beard or has a receding chin or is very large or the anesthetist has a very small hand, there may be a, a leak as they're trying to ventilate that patient before they go to sleep. So if you either smell the gas or if you can hear the gas leaking, then you can assist by putting your hand on the cheek, pulling it up against the mask, and then putting your thumb on the mask and gently pushing down. It really doesn't take that much pressure to be able to seal that leak. And then you can get good ventilation and you're not really putting forth a whole lot of effort, but you're doing a lot of good. Then when the patient's ready to be intubated and the anesthetist is trying to intubate the patient, some patients have good visibility, a large mouth, and they're able to open and there's not much obstructing, but sometimes there's obstruction and it would be hard for the anesthetist to see if you didn't help. So in that situation, when they're ready to put that tube in, they're gonna put in the laryngoscope and they're gonna sweep the tongue over to the patient's left and that's gonna leave the right side of the mouth for them to push the tube in. But if they can't see well, you can just take your finger and pull up on the cheek there and you can see how if you were trying to insert a tube down that right side and they're standing above the patient up here, how that would help them be able to put that tube in. Then you're either gonna help slip out the tube and if you do that, you be careful when you're pulling it out that you don't dislodge it as they're holding it. Or you may be the one who's inflating the balloon. If you're inflating the balloon, you wanna take that little test balloon and you wanna take your hand and just put enough air in it. You don't want it soft because then you don't have enough air and there's gonna be a leak in it. But if you put it too firm, then you put a lot of pressure in the trachea and it can break down. So you wanna have it so it's a firm balloon. So you wanna be squeezing it as you're putting the air in. If the, the anesthesiologist is putting in the air into the tubing, then what you're doing is you're taking the mask off the tubing that goes to the machine so that you can put it onto the endotracheal tube. And you want to kind of, when you're putting that on, hold, there's going to be lips on the endotracheal tube. You can hold your finger under as you're pushing it in so that you're not dislodging the tube because it's probably not taped in at that point yet. Sometimes patients need cricoid pressure. And there was a long time that I was not doing this correctly. So in case there's someone out there who isn't aware, like I wasn't, um, there's a little reminder. So when I was first doing the cricoid pressure, what are some of the indications for it? You may have a patient that has GERD. You may have a patient that ate uh, fairly recently and they need the surgery, but they have to do uh, cricoid pressure to prevent the abdominal contents, the gastric contents from coming up. Or you may have a pregnant person or a very obese person who is likely to aspirate. So if you're the one applying the cricoid pressure, you wanna keep this pressure on until the patient's intubated and until anesthesia has to listen to the breast sounds and said it's okay to release the pressure. So the cricoid pressure is on the cricoid. So how do you find the cricoid? This is your, your larynx is your Adam's apple and quote Adam's apple. And that's where I used to put the pressure. Now, if you try it on yourself, it's very uncomfortable. When you do that, you see it is very uncomfortable and it's not effective. So you don't want to put the pressure over there, but it is a landmark for you. You take the larynx and you go down to the next cartilage and then that next cartilage that you feel underneath the Adam's apple. And if you try it on yourself, that's the cricoid. And it's very important that that's the one that you push on. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But if you push on that, you can see it's much more comfortable. I'm pushing with a lot more pressure than I pushed on my larynx and it's not hurting me at all. But the reason why you want to put it on the cricoid is because of the anatomy of the trachea and the esophagus. So we're going to pretend that this is the esophagus. Looks like a better trachea, but it's, it's going to be the esophagus for this. So you have your tracheal rings and they're not really all rings. Most of the trachea is horseshoe and there's a reason for that. They need that horseshoe so the food bolus can go down the esophagus without being impeded by the trachea. 
so most of them are horseshoe and you can see if you pushed on one of those traco rings it wouldn't push it wouldn't occlude the esophagus at all the cricoid is the only one that has a complete ring on it so when you push on that you're pushing down and compressing on the esophagus and that's why you get the occlusion and that you want to have so that they don't aspirate.